Okay, so the, the, the next talk is, um, is about measurement of piezoelectric properties at high temperature mm -hmm. using resonance. And I'll give a little bit of introduction to the resonance technique. I'm sure many people here will, um, will um, know a lot about it anyway, but um, I'll, I'll review the technique. I'll describe the um, experimental setup um, that we're using, and then we'll look at some of the results, and, um, and then I'll show you some of the um, first stages that we're working on at the moment of the uncertainty evaluation as an outline of some of the remaining challenges with the work. Okay, so gaze metric resonance, um, um, me mechanical, if, if you take a piece of ceramic, it will have a number of mechanical um, resonance mode that depends on the mechanical properties of the material and its dimensions. Um, because it's a piezoelectric material, there's a coupling between the electrical and the mechanical regime, so um, at certain frequencies, um, those resonances can be excited electrically and they have an effect on the electrical impedance. And we see typically, um, if we do a frequency sweep on a piezoelectric sample, uh, we see the impedance um, goes to a very, very low value at the resonant frequency and a frequency slightly above that, it goes to a maximum um, at the anti-resonance frequency. And because this is an electrical measurement, um, then it's often convenient to describe this in terms of an electrical circuit, an equivalent electrical circuit, where the C0 is the basic static capacitance of the, um, of the material, of the device. Um, the inductance represents um, the, um, the mass or momentum in the material, and there's an additional capacitance um, which represents um, the coupling between the two. Okay, now this, this resonance technique is, is nothing new. It's been around um, a long time um, and it's encapsulated in a European standard, um, EN50324. And um, this, this is a systematic method for evaluating piezoelectric coefficients from the resonance spectrum. And to, um, to do that, we, I've shown here this resonance, anti-resonance peak, but you could imagine a um, typical sample will have many different resonant frequencies, different resonance modes. And if they're all close together, then they influence each other and we don't get a clear um, resonance, anti-resonance spectrum, and it, it has an influence on the results. So the standard specifies a number of geometries um, which enhance particular resonant modes and those different resonant modes can be used for deriving different parts of the piezoelectric coefficients. So typically um, there's a transverse length mode of measuring D31, there's a radial mode, um, there's um, a thickness extensional mode, a longitudinal length mode, so this one as you can imagine, will emphasise the 3-3 three, three, um, movement, and there's a shear mode resonator as well. There's some more fur further information here. There's, there's, there's quite a lot in, in the standard, and also in the, um, there's an original IEEE um, standard which um, um, preceded that. Um, but there's also, NPR have published a number of um, um, reports and so on on some of the um, techniques. Okay, so the, um, the, 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 the resonant technique in, in the N50324, it's specifically valid for low loss materials. And, um, and there, there, there are other techniques um, that, that look at, um, look at um, encompassing the losses. All materials are lossy. Um, if the losses are low, then the standard is described, the method described in the standard is fine, uh, but if the losses are high, which is often or usually the case when we're operating at high temperatures, um, then there are other methods which use complex 
um, complex constants for each of these circuit elements to represent the losses. And one of the commonest embodiments of, um, of that lossy model is PRAP, a piezoelectric resonance analysis program, which is a piece of software uh, which does a curve fitting to evaluate these complex coefficients. <coughs> and there's a paper here which reviews some of the techniques that are available. Usually, these techniques of working with lossy materials require some kind of computer evaluation, some curve fitting. Um, the, the resonant technique is in the standard, um, can be done analytically, there are a set of equations for deriving the coefficients. Um, this graph just shows um, the, the, the black line is the PRAP data and the red dots are the experimental spectrum. So you can see that the, the curve fitting of the PRAP data is quite close and represents the um, resonance and anti-resonant frequency as well, but it's not perfect. Okay, um, a few words about the experimental setup that, that we're using. Uh, we have a couple of systems um, um, that, that we can use for doing resonant measurements, but the one um, that um, we're using for the results that I'm presenting today is based on a thermomechanical analyzer. So it's a commercial it's, it's a commercial system um, for doing um, high temperature analysis. It can work up to 1,000 degrees C. And um, we've modified this. This is the, um, this is the test environment. And we've modified this to place some small electrical contacts and electrical wiring to enable us to carry out resonance measurements. And the other part of the equipment is uh, an impedance analyzer. Okay, now, with, with a lot of these um, small furnace techniques, they have the advantage of being um, quite quick. The, the test turnaround time is, is, not, is not long. Um, and it's, it's highly controllable within, within software. Um, but but there are, there, you do have to be very careful about the, the temperature calibration. And you see this cropping up in a number of the talks today. Um, it, it is challenging not to measure a temperature with a thermocouple. It's reasonably accurate across the temperature range we're interested in. Um, but to relate that temperature to the actual temperature of the sample. And so what, what we did um, in this system um, and the, the, the reason for that is when, when the sample is sat in a, in a furnace, perhaps in contact with um, other parts of the system, then there, there will be temperature gradients, there will be um, at higher temperature, there will be radiation influences um, on the temperature of the sample, and it's not necessarily at the same time temperature as a thermocouple that you place, even in quite close proximity to the sample. So what we did was we created a number of um, dummy samples, which were the same size and shape as the resonance samples we wanted to measure. And we fitted thermocouples, welded thermocouples to them, so the thermocouple is in very close thermal contact with the sample and used that to calibrate the temperature. And so this is the, um, the temperature calibration. What the, the calibration is relative to what I've marked as the TMA Thermocouple. So this is the thermocouple that the instrument uses to set its temperature. And we can see that there is some deviation. This is probably typical of these kinds of kinds of systems. There is some deviation up to about 10 degrees um, between the thermocouple temperature and the temperature of the sample. So um, these um, ranges here, this is actually composed of a number of curves for all of the different sample shapes that we used. The sample shape didn't seem to make a big um, or consistent difference, and they all fitted within that envelope. So we fitted a polynomial to that, we used that as our temperature calibration, and the standard deviation of that envelope is around um, 3.6 degrees. So we think that our temperature with that calibration is accurate to within that range of uncertainty. Okay, so here's, here's some of the results. Um, this is um, some results on a Morgan PZT. 
and um, we can see uh, um, on the this axis here is the frequency. So a slice through there will show you the um, a, a particular spectrum. So you can see we go um, here we approach the resonance. Um, this is the admittance. So the admittance goes through a maximum, um, which is the red bit. Then through a minimum of the anti-resonance, and then we move away from the resonant region. This axis here, um, each of these is a spectrum at a different temperature, and so you can quite clearly see the variation of the resonant and anti-resonant frequencies as the temperature increases, and we get to, in this case, about 360 Celsius, and the resonance ceases at the curing temperature of the material. And on cooling, um, we cool back down from uh, this measurement went up to about 600 degrees. Um, as we cool back down, we go through uh, a peak in the emittance, um, which is a peak in the permittivity, um, but then below that there is no resonance because the sample has been depoled. Now this here is just a graph showing uh, the D31 um, evaluated according to the standard from the data in these graphs. <coughs> And you can see there's some, some interesting, interesting behaviour going on there. Broadly, the, um, the D31 increases over the whole of the temperature range, disappears at the Curie temperature, but there are some um, other things happening in there. Okay, and um, this is um, some of the results on one of the materials um, from Leeds. I think it's not actually lampful, is it, Tim? I think that's a typo there. Um, and um, but this is one of the materials in, um, in Tim's list which he showed, showed earlier. And so again we've got the heating and we can see the, uh, the resonance, anti-resonance. Um, this, this will be a different size and shape of sample, so the, the, um, the width of the resonance and the frequencies of the resonance will all be different, so I don't think we can read too much into the fact that that looks thin. Um, but we can see some slightly different um, aspects of the, of the behaviour. There's a, a general kind of frequency dependence in a lot of the properties here, and a, a fairly straightforward um, change in the resonant and anti resonant frequencies with, with temperature. And on cooling, again, we've got a slightly more complex frequency dependence of the, um, of the properties. It's we would expect these types of materials, um, but again the resonance has disappeared as it's been depolled. So Paul, what was the shape of the sample in that particular case? Was it a disc or...? In that particular case, that will be a... Um, that will be... I'll just go back to the sample. So I think that's one of these shapes. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay, so these are the results from the evaluation, and so the, the top line is the, um, the D31 coefficient evaluated according to the standard, and we've just applied the standard here in a very simple way. The standard says that, um, that the lossy materials, the number of frequencies are, are equivalent, and we, we, so we just applied it in a very direct way and compared it with the results of the lossy model, the PRAP um, evaluation. And you can see um, that, that certainly as the temperature increases, the discrepancy um, between those two curves can become very, um, very significant indeed. And um, there, there are a number of reasons for that. One of them is frequency dependence of the properties of the material, in particular the capacitance. The standard asks us to use the capacitance measured at, at one kilohertz. And, um, and particularly at high temperature, um, the permittivity, the capacitance, can be quite frequency dependent. And as you go to lower frequencies, the conductivity um, couples into the measured capacitance and that can cause um, discrepancies in, in the capacitance measurements of one kilohertz. So what we've done here is um, taken 
the capacitance measurement from the slope of the, uh, the lower frequency end of the resonance spectrum. So this, this is much, much closer in frequency to the frequency that we're measuring the resonance. Um, in, in, in some ways you have to be quite careful with that because if the frequency at which you're measuring the permittivity is too close to the resonance, the resonance influences the value that you get. So there's no perfect solution, but we wanted to get it away from that low frequency end where we're seeing significant frequency dependence. And we compared it with the, the PRAP. The PRAP also comes up with measure of the permittivity based on its fit to the overall spectrum. And we get reasonable agreement between the, um, the um, capacitance evaluated this way and the PRAP value. Uh, I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but our value is the, the green line, which for most of the time overlaps with the black line. So that's, that's the capacitance, and that, that improves, improves the results. But there's, there's another effect going on, um, which is a little bit more subtle. And, um, and in this top graph, um, this is the resonance spectrum. I've expanded it around the resonance area so you can see what's going on. And the red lines are the maximum minimum of the modulus of the impedance, um, as described in the standard. Um, but the green lines are the, um, the series and parallel frequencies. These, these are two of the frequencies that are specified um, that, that are used in PRAP. And in the standard, all of these frequency pairs are equivalent in a low loss or no loss material. Um, all of these frequency pairs are equivalent, and these two pairs of lines should, um, should uh, coincide. Uh, but in fact, they don't, and they don't by quite a, quite a long way. And that, that is one of the major sources in, in error of using the modulus of the impedance from the, um, in, in the standard. And you can see here what PRAP is actually doing. Um, the series resonance corresponds with the real part of the emittance and the parallel frequency corresponds with the, um, with the real, with the resistance. Okay, these, um, this, this diagram is, is out of the standard um, and it shows the relationship between these, these different frequency pairs. Um, and some of them relate to the maximum and minimum of this circle, some of them relate to the um, diameter of the circle taken from the origin, and some of them relate to where it cuts the, um, the axis. And in, within the framework of the standard for a low loss material, all these frequency pairs are the same, they happen at the same frequency, um, but when we're trying to do measurements at high temperature, then we need to take into account the fact that they're not the same. And generally, if we can measure Fs and Fp, then we, in the measurements that we've done so far, will get reasonable results. Now, I'm sure we'll find some exceptions to that. Um, and we, we have tried to evaluate all of these different frequencies exactly as they are stated in, the, um, in this diagram. And this side shows an actual measured frequency sweep at 350 degrees C. Um, we've got the resistance on one axis and the reactance on the other axis. And, um, and you can see that it's a long way from this ideal, um, this ideal measurement. And one of the difficulties, um, particularly at higher temperatures, is getting the uh, crossing of the, um, the x-axis. And we're, we're going to go back and, and have a look at this, this again. Um, there's, there's an offset here. Um, even, even though you compensate for strain inductances and strain capacitances when you set up the measurement, um, there's a limit to how effective that compensation is. And at some point, um, it's going to, to have an influence. Okay, there, there are other limiting factors as well. And what, what we've got here is um, a simulation, really. We took an experimental spectrum and mathematically added parallel resistance to 
attempt to simulate the conductivity of the material at high temperature. And these sorts of temperatures, anything above 200 degrees C, uh, maybe even lower than that, depending on the material, we're starting to see significant levels of conductivity. And we wanted to understand, um, we, we don't know, even though um, the, the models that are used in Pratt um, have been um, used in quite a lot of different um, circumstances, um, we, we, we don't know how valid they are for these measurements and at what point um, they're going to run into problems. So what we've done is varied in the simulation that parallel resistance and run the spectra back through Pratt. Um, so we know what the piezoelectric coefficients and so on are for this spectrum. Um, and as we decrease that parallel resistance, this is one over the resistance in kilohms, then everything's fine. And um, then around um, around with two here, um, which would be about 500 ohms, then things start to deviate from what we know to be the real answer. And then at a certain point, um, the curves, if you look at the curves on, on these, the, the, the best inspection, they, they just look so far away from what we would expect that um, the curve fitting routine is not able to produce a good match. So there are some limits, um, probably at the lower um, resistance end of what we're likely to encounter with these measurements. Okay, I'll just say a little bit um, about um, the um, the uncertainty evaluation. This this is important. Um, I've already hinted at, at one of the reasons. Um, if we are going to evaluate case electric properties using the resonance method, then there is always some model, some assumptions um, which relate the measured spectra to the piezoelectric properties. And we need to understand um, the, the uncertainties and how the uncertainties in the measurements of the spectra, so the frequencies, um, the impedances and so on, how they relate to the figures that we produce finally for the piezoelectric properties. And, um, and this will give us a level of confidence in in, in the measurements. So when we come to compare between different models or between different techniques, so for instance if we um, are comparing the resonance results with the results from interferometry, we need to know the range of uncertainties of the different measurement techniques. So what we've done here is we've taken the approach um, in the guide to the expression of uncertainty in measurement. This is a, an internationally accepted method for evaluating uncertainties of measurement. We take a number of input quantities, um, which I'll describe in a minute. We put them through a measurement model, um, which in the case of the resonance standard, and the equations um, in the standard, and we produce an output quantity, which are the piezoelectric coefficients. And um, what we can do there then is we can evaluate the contributions to the uncertainty from all of these different input quantities, add them all up, and we get an overall value. Okay, so um, if, if we just, at the moment, we've just done this in a very, um, very direct, very, very simple way, and you, you, you'll see that, that there, as ever, are some um, more complexities to this that, that we need to build into it. But if we take um, the measurements that we make, so you take measurements of the resonant frequency, the anti-resonant frequency, um, the parallel frequency, um, the capacitance, and the dimensions of the sample. These are the equations straight out of the standard, so we put all those values into these equations. Um, from those, we can derive a value of, in this case, the D33 coefficient as an example. And, um, and so this, this is, this is what, what we get at that initial first pass. So we put in um, some figures for the, um, the typical frequency resolution spacing between the frequency samples on the impedance analyzer, um, what we think are some maybe sensible values on the capacitance variation, and um, some, some values for the, um, for the um, sample dimensions and the mass. So these are the, these are the actual values, um, and then these are the contributions into the 
uncertainty, um, the overall uncertainty of measurement. And so if we, if we add up all those contributions to the uncertainty, then we come up with, for this example, um, in this example we've got a D33 of 294 picometers per volt. We come up with an uncertainty of around 4 picometers per volt. And these are the sources of the uncertainty. Um, so um, the, the, the mass of the sample, for instance, is, is quite important. Um, and the, um, the resolution of the, of the frequencies. Now, these depend a lot on how you set up your experiments. If you have very few frequency points through the resonance, these uncertainties would become much larger. Uh, if you have a very um, fine grid, very high sample rate for frequencies, then those would reduce. Um, but it also illustrates as well things that are not in here, because we don't have any um, evaluation of things like frequency dependence of the, of the coefficients, which can produce large areas, as I've said, in, for instance, the capacitance. Um, and we, we, we don't have that in this model at the moment. So this essentially is showing the uncertainties associated directly with the instrumentation effects. Um, but there are other things that, that need to be taken into account. Okay, so um, conclusions. I've got a lot of, a lot of words here. Um, but, but basically, if we just apply the standard in a very direct and simple way, um, as it describes, then we can find <coughs> some quite big errors, um, particularly at, <coughs> at elevated temperatures, where we become a long, long way away from that lossy model which is assumed in the standard. Um, the uncertainties associated with the direct instrumentation effects are, are, are quite, quite small, um, but, the, uh, but these deviations are around more how we interpret the results rather than the instrumentation effects. Now that's not always going to be the case. There are some situations where, um, for instance, some of the D33 rods have got a very small capacitance and taken care of a compensation for residuals in the impedance analyzer um, um, will never be perfect and that can add into the uncertainty. So it is very dependent on the exact sample and the measurement that we're taking. Um, but in general, we know that there are some big um, um, issues around the interpretation of the measurements. Okay, so um, um, the properties are frequency dependent as well, particularly at, at higher temperature, and none of these models include frequency dependence in, in, um, in the models. Um, so if we put in some relatively straightforward corrections for those, or accommodation for those deviations, then we can get the results that are uh, generally in good agreement with, um, with Pratt, with the lossy model, uh, but we're still left with no um, direct confirmation. We don't really know that the Pratt is giving us the, the right answer either. Um, and we can see that, that at some point, then even those um, curve fitting models will, will fall over. And this is why it's extremely valuable um, and um, we're in the process of this at the moment of making comparisons between these different techniques. With the interferometric techniques, which we'll see later, then we have a more direct measure of the piezoelectric properties and we can use those to evaluate um, the results from resonance measurement. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you.